This week in IT, Microsoft changes its support policy for Microsoft 365 apps on Windows 10. Windows 11 24H2 is now broadly available, but not without some issues. And I look at the May updates for Teams. So stay tuned for all the latest news. Welcome to This Week in IT, the show where I talk about everything connected to Microsoft 365, Azure, and Windows. But before I get started, I've got a quick favor to ask you. About 80% of the people who watched the last video weren't subscribed to the channel. Now, as we go live today, we're on about 12,020 subscribers. I'd love it if we could push that up to 12,100 this week. So if you'd like to see these weekly news updates from Petri.com, please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to hit the bell notification to make sure that you don't miss out on the latest uploads. Now, as we all know, Microsoft is ending support for Windows 10 on October 10th this year. So organizations need to be prepared to either migrate to Windows 11 or pay for extended security updates that will be available for a limited time if you're really not ready to move to a new operating system at that point. Now, back in January this year, Microsoft also said that they would not be supporting Microsoft 365 apps, so things like Word, Excel, the desktop apps that you install on your device as part of your Microsoft 365 subscription past October the 10th on Windows 10 devices. So while you could still use them, they would not receive any updates, no support for those apps whatsoever. Of course, they're trying to get organizations to move and give them a real impetus to migrate to Windows 11. Now, this week, Microsoft has changed their story a little bit about that. So what they're saying now is that if you're going to be using Windows 10 beyond the end of support date this year, we are going to provide you with security updates for Microsoft 365 apps, but no feature updates. So you'll be able to keep the apps and make sure that they are secure on the device, but any feature updates will not be provided to you and you will not be able to request new features if you're a big corporate customer still running Windows 10. Now it's thought that about 53% of the share for desktop operating systems is Windows 10 and 44% for Windows 11. Now that's a big change from a year ago when Windows 10 had 70% of the share. So things are starting gradually to turn in the favor of Windows 11, but of course there's still a long way to go. It's always quite strange when Microsoft make these big announcements about end of support because you can usually wait a couple of months and it's very often that Microsoft backtracks on what they've said and this time why have they backtracked because of course a lot of criticism from customers especially those I imagine who are planning to pay for those extended security updates for Windows 10 to suddenly be told well you can do that but essentially we're going to leave you with an insecure system if you're using Microsoft 365 apps because of course we all know that most organizations that are using Windows especially large organizations, are also going to be using Microsoft 365 and those desktop apps. So you're basically saying, well, yeah, you're giving it to them in one hand and you've got to pay for it. And we're taking away that security piece from you in the other hand, essentially rendering what you just paid for useless because the device won't be secure. So of course, that was never a great policy from Microsoft's point of view. If they're going to offer these extended security updates for a fee, then of course they have to keep key applications that they provide also secure on those devices, even if that means you're not going to get feature updates. And I think the kind of compromise that they've reached now is the right balance. Microsoft has also suggested that if you're not able to upgrade to Windows 11, but you want to keep some of the new features that might come, you might think about using the online versions of the applications. Of course, I think that's going to be problematic for many organizations because the online versions while they're quite functional, they're not always as functional as the desktop version of the apps. And some people 
old-fashioned people like me. I just prefer to use the desktop version of the app. I just think it runs more smoothly, faster. I know that maybe sometimes they bring some really cool functionality to the online versions, which don't always come to the desktop apps or come sometime later. But I think for large organizations, you know, suggesting that you use the online app as an alternative isn't necessarily going to be a great option for them. Let me know in the comments below, are you planning to migrate to Windows 11 if your organization is still on Windows 10 or will you be delaying that and paying for extended security updates? I'd love to know what your plans are in the comments below. Microsoft also announced this week while we're on the subject of operating systems that Windows 11 version 24H2 that was released last fall is now broadly available. So an operating system for corporate use usually becomes broadly available about six months after the initial rollout begins to people who are using unmanaged systems. So if you're a corporate that is managing your endpoints, you've always been able to control whether those devices get a, a new you know, feature update. So 24H2 in this case of Windows 11 or not. But if you're running an unmanaged system, let's say you're a small business using Windows 11 Pro or God forbid, home, then you don't get the same control. So for instance, I have devices here, some of them have 24H2, some of them do not. It depends on the hardware and the software and whether Microsoft deems the devices ready for that operating system updates and, you know, and the age of the device, you know, does it have up to date hardware or not? So what Microsoft usually does is it rolls out these updates in a stage manner over many months to really identify problems. They do this instead of testing, of course, they do it in proper testing. And, you know, we as, you know, commercial customers who are using unmanaged systems are essentially guinea pigs yeah, and we just get to test those things as and when they become available. Now I still have systems here that still haven't automatically upgraded or I haven't been offered an upgrade to 24H2 despite Microsoft saying that it's now available. I don't believe on those systems as any blocking issues but you know maybe it will come uh, at some point over the next few weeks. So what are the blocking issues that Microsoft still cites may prevent devices from getting 24H2? Microsoft says that users who are working with Azure Virtual Desktop and app attached may experience problems and they're blocking the upgrade. They plan to have a fix for that available in June this year. So you're gonna to have to wait a bit longer if you're using that technology. There's also a security driver that's manufactured by a company called Sential that has some issues with 24H2. And if you're using that application, Microsoft is also still blocking updates at this point. And there's no real timeline given for when a fix for that might be available. What does 24H2 bring to the table? Well, you know, it's really um, uh, some tweaks and things, especially if you're you're using ARM-based PCs or some tweaks to the ARM-based infrastructure to improve performance. So that will be important. There's a redesigned uh, co-pilot interface. There's better integration for phone link with the start menu. There's Wi-Fi 7 support. And if you're using Windows 11 Enterprise, this update now supports hot patching. And Microsoft announced this month that they have released their first hot patch for organizations that opt into that for Windows 11 Enterprise. And hot patching basically means you don't have to restart the device. You're only gonna get security updates like this, but you just have to restart the device once every three months instead of every month on Patch Tuesday. Microsoft also released a whole load of updates for Teams this month. So let's have a look at the most important. So if you're a Teams premium user, you can now upload up to five Five brand themes to brand your meetings. IT admins will be able to send messages to meeting chats 
before and after meetings. So that might come in useful. You know, they're saying IT admins. I'm not sure why that would be limited to IT admins and why the organizer of the meeting couldn't do that. Maybe they can. I haven't actually tried. But now IT admins can apparently do that. I'd like to see that functionality extended to more people. Intelligent recap alerts. So when an intelligent recap for a meeting becomes available, so this usually takes a little bit of time after a meeting so that, you know, the AI can look through the transcript and generate that intelligent recap. Users who are part of the meeting will now get an alert to say that it's ready. So I think that's really important. And for those customers that are using Teams Essential, now there is bi-directional calendar syncing for Google Calendar. So that's probably going to be important for smaller businesses who are also using Google Workspace or whatever they call it these days. There have been some enhancements to the chat and collaboration features. Probably the most notable is that you now get tag-based filtering in the activity feed in Teams. So I haven't really used, used it that much. So I don't know, let me know in the comments whether you think the activity feed is really useful or not. But now you can filter by tag mentions. For those of you using Teams Rooms, there are now some updates that allow uh, those on Windows to manage live transcriptions during meetings and to choose their translation language. So users can choose their translation language for live captions without affecting other people. So that's probably really useful as well. There are a few security updates also uh, now available in this May update. So sensitivity labels can now be applied by administrators to Teams meetings based on the sensitivity label of any files shared within that meeting. So I'm actually surprised that that feature didn't exist before because obviously if you rely on those sensitivity labels, that is really important. And the Teams client health dashboard. So IT admins can now monitor Teams client updates, uh, which I think is really important to understand the people using the latest version of the client or not, because that might indicate why a user is experienced experiencing problems, for instance. And in that dashboard, you can also manage contacts for Teams phones devices. Just as a footnote, really, to this conversation, I've never really been a fan of Slack on the desktop, the, the interface, although I do think it's improved quite a bit. And, you know, while I've never been a big fan of Slack, Teams has taken some, some of the good bits of Slack and, you know, kind of implemented them in their own interface. But I recently installed the mobile app for Slack on my iPhone. And actually, I actually prefer the mobile version of Slack than the desktop version. I think it's much cleaner and easier to use and navigate, at least in the small time that I've used it so far. And I thought, mm, this is actually maybe a little bit better design than the mobile application for Teams, although <laughs> I prefer the Teams Teams desktop app. So I was thinking, you know, maybe Microsoft is putting a little bit too much functionality into the mobile app. That interface there is becoming a little bit messy. So I would like to see the mobile app for Teams cleaned up, have a little bit of a cleaner interface. While I've enjoyed some of the improvements to the desktop app recently, I do think there's a little bit of a way to go with the mobile app still. Let me know what you think about that. If you got value out of this video, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a thumbs up on YouTube because it really helps to get the video seen by more people. I'm going to leave you with another video on the screen now about some changes to hot patching in Windows Server 2025, which is really important to understand right now if you are planning to use that feature beyond the end of this month. So do check that out. But that's it from me for this week and I'll see you next time.